Waveguide Analysis Setup. In this lecture, we are not actually going to analyze any waveguides. It turns out there's a bit of work we have to do, starting with Maxwell's equations, to manipulate those into the differential equations that we will ultimately solve in order to analyze waveguides. But all we're doing in this lecture is looking at the waveguide, looking at its symmetry, and learning how to simplify Maxwell's equations and cast them into forms that make it easy for us to solve. And it will turn out there will be four broad categories. And the first broad category, of course, is something called hybrid modes. And that is where we have all six field components. We can't make any simplifications. And we can analyze any waveguide as a hybrid mode. If it is not a hybrid mode, if it is TEM or TE or TM, it will fall out. So in a way, we could just leave you with analyzing only hybrid modes. The problem is the math is very complicated and honestly only practical for a solution on a computer. However, there are lots of special cases where we can simplify things. And if a transmission line supports a TEM mode, that reduces our equations the most significantly. And it will turn out that's just a electrostatic analysis. In other waveguides that support TE and TM modes, things simplify and we can cast our equations another way. And then last, I'll leave you with how to analyze slab waveguides. Remember, we're not analyzing the waveguides here, simply manipulating Maxwell's equations to set up the differential equations that we will solve in later lectures. Let's start just by looking at the basic equations, the governing equations for analyzing waveguides. Here are the basic steps that we will use to analyze a waveguide. Step one is to draw the waveguide, label the dimensions, collect the material properties, make sure we know everything there is to know about that waveguide in order to analyze it. The next thing we will do is just write the general form of the solution. If we're analyzing a dielectric waveguide, we understand the field outside decays exponentially. Uh, otherwise, in any waveguide, the mode is really the product of two terms. It has an amplitude term, that is the picture of the mode in the cross section, and there's another term that oscillates, and it's the product of those two terms. And we can substitute that back into Maxwell's equations, and then Maxwell's equations change slightly because now it's in, term, in terms of the amplitude and this oscillation term. We will simplify the equations then based on the geometry of the waveguide. Perhaps it's homogeneous dielectric or a uniform direction or something like that. That allows us to set some terms equal to zero and simplify our equations considerably. Pretty much no matter what we do, we're always manipulating Maxwell's equations, simplifying where we can, but collecting it into a single differential equation that we have to solve. And that's what we call the governing equation. We can solve the governing equation. If we have an inhomogeneous waveguide and we're solving this by hand, we will solve each homogeneous region separately and then connect them together using boundary conditions. Once we have that, we have the overall field solution. From there, we can, from that solution, pull out the waveguide parameters such as the phase constant, the characteristic impedance, the picture of what the fields look like, cutoff frequencies, all of those other things. So that's the general procedure that will follow. So we always start with Maxwell's equations. And since Maxwell's curl equations are the ones that predict propagation, that's where we'll start. So here's Maxwell's equations. And of course, the constitutive relations have been substituted into these because we see the permeability and permittivity. So I guess they're not purely Maxwell's curl equations, but we'll just call them Maxwell's curl equations to be lazy. Given the two curl equations, we substitute one into the other and we derive a wave equation. The wave equation we derived here is for general inhomogeneous media. And 
this is not real practical to solve by hand, but this is the equation that we would use if we were solving it on a computer. So for this class, we're solving things by hand. So we need to make a simplification. We will assume that all of the materials are linear, homogeneous, and isotropic. And so our previous wave equation now reduces to a much simpler wave equation where we've replaced our omega squared mu epsilon with this k squared, which is our wave number. Now, another interesting thing that happens when the medium is homogeneous and isotropic is that our single vector wave equation has actually separated into three independent equations that really need to be solved independently. Now, they're all the same equation, so if we solve for the general solution of one, we can reuse that for the others, but they are independent equations in homogeneous isotropic media, and that's going to lead to a lot of simplifications for us. So the first thing we're going to do is start with these curl equations and expand them. Those are two vector equations that we can expand into a set of six coupled partial differential equations. Now the real problem with this is we have three, six things to solve for. We have the X, Y, and Z component of the electric field. And likewise, we have the X, Y, and Z component of the magnetic fields. That is six things to solve for. We have a lot of work ahead of us if we want to do that. Well, this is where the simplifications come in, and we will talk more about that. But we would like to reduce this number of terms. We're also going to assume the general form of modes in a waveguide. And so the overall electric field that has everything is written here, just E vectorial as a function of X, Y, and Z. So the overall electric field is written as the product of two terms. And by the way, this is a manifestation of the block theorem from solid state physics. But anyway, these two terms, we have e to the minus j beta z, and we'll recognize that this term is oscillation. So that is what is responsible for the mode accumulating phase as it propagates along the waveguide. It also has this amplitude term. That's a picture of the mode in the cross section of the waveguide. Notice that is not a function of z. So once we calculate what this picture looks like, and I'm showing that over on the right as this red blob here, that picture does not change. All it does as it propagates along the waveguide is accumulate phase according to this term, this e to the minus j beta z. So in a way, a mode propagating along the waveguide is a boring thing. That picture stays the same. It just accumulates phase. However, since nothing too interesting is happening in that z direction this lets us do something really neat even though this is a three-dimensional thing it lets this whole problem mathematically reduce to a two-dimensional problem so our three-dimensional waveguide really only needs to be analyzed in its cross section that is a two-dimensional analysis so really without any approximations uh, almost any waveguide can be analyzed just in its cross section. So that is very useful and also simplifies things for us. So here's a visualization of what I just talked about. That picture floating above the waveguide, this is that amplitude term and it does not change. It stays the same. The only thing that's happening to that is it is accumulating phase according to the E to the minus j beta z. Now, what I'm showing inside the waveguide is that amplitude term with the phase being accumulated. Now, since our eyes can't see complex numbers, I have to plot the real part of that. That's why it appears to change as it's going down the waveguide, but it's really just accumulating phase. So this is the best way I can visualize what a mode looks like in a waveguide. 
let's go back to the math. So we've assumed this form of the solution that is the product of two terms. And we can do the same thing either with the electric fields, which we did, and also with the magnetic field. Same thing. Now what we're going to do is take that solution and substitute it back into our set of six coupled partial differential equations. Now, instead of having, for example, EX, EY, EZ, we see instead now we have the E naught X, E naught Y, E naught Z. These are the components of that amplitude term. And we also notice our Z derivatives have disappeared and our partial with respect to Z has become J beta. All this is saying is nothing really changes in that Z direction except the mode accumulating phase, which is described by the J beta. So our six couple partial differential equations have simplified a little bit, but we still have a huge problem. We still have six field components to solve for the X, Y, and Z components of the electric field and the X, Y, and Z components of the magnetic field. So we would like to do something to reduce the amount of work that we have to do. So without any approximations, it will turn out we can simplify this. Let's just jump right into it. Let's do our first simplification. And this is without any approximation. So we're still analyzing any waveguide out there. And we have our set of six coupled partial differential equations that we talked about previously, where we've already substituted in our form of the solution. But we still have six unknowns to solve for. A really neat trick that we can do, we can put E naught X, E naught Y, H naught X, H naught Y. We can put all four of those terms completely in terms of just E naught Z and H naught Z. That's pretty cool. The reason this is cool is that we only have to solve for two terms now. If we can somehow magically find E naught Z and H naught Z, we can just immediately and quickly calculate E naught X, E naught Y, H naught X, H naught Y. So we've dramatically simplified our problem. We only need to find two things, and this was done without approximation. Let's actually derive those equations so I can show you where they come from. So at the top of this screen, we have our original six equations. So the first thing we'll do is we will grab equation 1E and solve it for E naught Y. And the answer is given down here. Then we'll take that expression and substitute it up in equation 1A. So we see our E naught Y term here. So we will replace this E naught Y with the expression we've derived here. And now we end up on the equation with just E naught Z, H naught X, and H naught Z. So we have three of our terms in there. Notice that H naught X appears in there twice. So we can expand this equation, collect all the terms, and solve for that H naught X. And when we do that, we have our H naught X just in terms of E naught Z and H naught Z. So we've derived one of our equations. Well, if we do this three more times, we can derive three similar equations. So we'll go back to the previous slide. We'll solve equation 1D for E naught X, and we will plug that new expression into equation 1B now we have H naught Y just in terms of E naught Z and H naught Z. We can substitute equation 1B, I'm sorry, solve equation 1B for H naught Y, plug that into equation 1D, and we get an expression for E naught X just in terms of E naught Z and H naught Z. And last, solve equation 1A for H naught X, plug that into equation 1E, and now we have an equation for E naught Y completely in terms of E naught Z and H naught Z. In each of those equations, we derive four, there was a, a K squared minus beta squared. 
to sort of simplify our equations, we will just call this Kc squared. And this term is going to come up later when we start looking at cutoff condition for our waveguides. That's the frequency below which a propagating mode is no longer propagating, no longer supported by the waveguide. But for now, we're just going to think about this as a substitution to simplify our equations. And when we do that, the four equations we've derived look like this. And here's this Kc squared, which remembers really just our wave number squared minus our phase constant squared. So our problem reduces simply to finding E naught Z and H naught Z. And once we know those functions, we can plug them into these equations to get our remaining four field components. And that's usually a very easy step. The hard part is finding E naught Z and H naught Z. So how do we find those? Well, now we're going to make an approximation. Up to now, we made no approximations. Now we're going to assume that the dielectric in our waveguide is linear homogeneous isotropic. Remember what that did. That let us simplify our wave equation and it also decoupled all of the field components, at least in terms of how we're solving them. So we solve the X component, Y component, and Z component of E completely separately and similarly for the magnetic field. So remember what we just did. We only have to find E naught Z and H naught Z. So really, all we have to do is solve these last two equations. So what we'll do is we'll take the form of our solution for EZ plug it in here and we get a new wave equation just in terms of E naught Z. So this is the differential equation we would have to solve to find E naught Z. And I can do the same thing with our magnetic field wave equation. Substitute in the form of the solution. I end up here and now this is the differential equation we would use to find H naught Z. Now remember we can only do this for LHI materials. So we're assuming homogeneous materials inside of our waveguides. These are two separate independent differential equations. And so that'll turn out to be important and we'll go through that. Let's lay out all of our solution categories. Well, the first one happens when we can't make any simplification. We have a crazy waveguide in homogeneous dielectric, really complicated. And so we have to somehow solve for E naught Z or H naught Z. Neither one of those is zero. That's a hybrid mode analysis. This is going to be tough. I'll show you how to set up the equations uh, and I'll point to how it would be solved, but we're not going to do that in this course. Now there are times where we can make approximations. One is if it's a transmission line and has a homogeneous dielectric, so those support TEM modes. In this case, E naught, E naught Z and H naught Z are both zero. And in fact, those two equations we just derived, we can't really use to solve for the TEM mode, which is the transverse electromagnetic mode. So we'll have to do something else, but that takes us in a whole other direction that we will talk about. If it's not a transmission line, but has a homogeneous fill, those support TE and TM modes. And so in this case, we have those two differential equations, one for E naught Z and one for H naught Z. We can take a zero solution for a one and solve the other. So each of those equations lead to two sets of modes. One leads to the transverse electric modes. That's when the E naught Z is zero. And we call that transverse electric because the, since the Z component of the electric field is zero, that only leaves X and Y components. Those are transverse to the direction of propagation. Likewise, when H naught Z is zero, we're solving for the transverse magnetic mode. But just to remind you again, this only happens when there's a homogeneous dielectric. The last case is when we have a slab waveguide and slab waveguides have a uniform direction. That'll take us in yet another direction to analyze waveguides. I'll remind you of one thing, hybrid mode analysis can do anything. If we had only one to choose, 
I would choose we would do this one. Now, I would choose to do hybrid mode analysis on a computer and not by hand, but all these other solutions down below fall out of that. There's special cases of that. But the ones on the bottom row are where we can make enough simplifications where we can analyze things on paper, and that's what we're going to proceed with. Let's first look at how to set up Maxwell's equations for analyzing hybrid modes. This is the general case where we can't make any simplifications. The first thing we'll do is we will back up and not look at the approach where we solve for E not Z, H not Z. Let's go back to our original set of six coupled partial differential equations, but after we substituted in the form of our solution. What we'll do is we'll take the equation 1C and 2C, solve 2C for the E not Z, and solve 1C for the H not Z. So we're solving for the longitudinal field components. Then what we'll do is we will take these two expressions for H not Z and E not Z and plug them back into the remaining four equations. What we've done is algebraically eliminated H not Z and E not Z. We did not set them equal to zero. We didn't just cross them out. We just algebraically eliminated them. Now we're down to a set of four differential equations that are just the transverse field components, just the X and Y components. From there, we will take our four equations that we had and form two matrix equations. We're calling these equations six and seven. We'll take equation seven and solve it for the magnetic field. So we're really just bringing beta over to the other side. Now that we have this big expression for our magnetic fields, H naught X and H naught Y, we can take this expression for the magnetic fields and plug that in up here. And what we're left with is a single matrix equation just in terms of the electric fields. So it turns out that is the equation that we would solve to analyze hybrid modes. I don't think this is realistic to do on paper, although it is possible and, and people do that. Uh, this is used, in my opinion, more for solving waveguides on a computer. So we won't use this equation in this class, but it's kind of fun to point out it and laugh at how big it is and complicated it is. And that's also motivation for us to want to simplify this to actually analyze some other very meaningful cases. Now, when I was in school, one thing that bothered me was what is the validity of these approximations? How can we just assume certain fields are zero? And all? And that really bothered me. So when I got into graduate school and when I got to the point where I could write computer codes to do rigorous analysis of waveguides, I didn't believe that. And I went back and I looked and I calculated modes of dielectric waveguides. And what I saw was, even though this mode is supposed to have X, Y, and Z components, I did see that some of those components were like six orders of magnitude less than others. And it turns out in a lot of dielectric waveguides, we have what are called linearly polarized modes where the electric field really tends to be very strongly only in one direction. So it might turn out that's the X direction and the Y component is six orders of magnitude less. So really that does justify we could ignore the Y component or the X component. And to put this into mathematical context, what that really means is that the cross coupling, these off diagonal terms in the matrix are very close to zero. So if X and Y components are not strongly coupled, that will mean when we get solutions, it'll be mostly X or mostly Y. And in fact, from out of that falls two simplified equations. These are much easier to solve and still lead to pretty good solutions. So those are called your linearly polarized modes. They are not purely linearly polarized, but the other component is very, very small.
This is something else we won't be doing in this class, but it's interesting and I figured I would point it out. Now on to setting up our equations for TEM analysis. This is the easiest one to solve, so we will do it first. Let's remind ourselves of the existence conditions for TEM, and there really are two requirements. One, we need a transmission line. That is a waveguide with two or more conductors. And two, it has to have a homogeneous fill. So suppose we have this structure. This does not support a TEM mode. It has a homogeneous dielectric. However, it only has one conductor around the outside. So it doesn't meet the definition of a transmission line. What about a microstrip? Well, this is a transmission line. It has two conductors, but it does not have a homogeneous dielectric. If you can imagine for a moment electric field lines fringing from the conductor into the air and down into the dielectric, it's punching through two different dielectrics that is inhomogeneous. This does not support a TEM mode. It does support something very close to a TEM mode, but it does not support a true TEM mode. What about a strip line? Well, we have three conductors here. That's two or more, so it meets the definition of a transmission line, and it has a homogeneous fill surrounding the signal line. So this would support a TEM mode. It's a transmission line and has a homogeneous fill. Now for TEM waves, it turns out E not Z and H not Z are both zero. So what we can do is go back to our original set of six coupled partial differential equations after the solution was plugged back in and look anywhere there is a Z component of either the electric or the magnetic field. And we can just cross it off. And when we do that, our six equations simplify considerably. So here's the six equations from the previous slide. Now what we'll do, first thing, is we will solve equation 2D for HY. We will take that expression for H not Y, and we will plug that into equation 2B. So we're replacing this H not Y with this expression for E not X. Now we have a single equation just in terms of E not X, and we can simplify that down to this expression. And of course, we can cancel E not X from both sides. We have beta squared equals K squared. But long story short, this shows that for TEM modes, when we're analyzing TEM modes, our phase constant beta is equal to the wave number K. So they are the same thing for TEM analysis. We talked briefly about this cutoff wave number. I know we didn't mention that a whole lot yet, and then we'll talk about this more in, in following lectures, but that was k squared minus beta squared. Well, if these two terms are equal, this cutoff wave number is zero. And what we will conclude from this is the TEM modes have no cutoff frequency. So we will have a TEM mode all the way down to DC. Now let's derive the equation we will use to analyze a waveguide supporting a TEM mode, which is a transmission line. So if it supports a TEM mode, the Z component is gone. And in fact, our wave equation doesn't contain a Z component, so I'm reminding us here, it's still a vector equation because it can point in the X and Y directions, but I'm writing this X, Y here to remind us there is no Z component for TEM. Well, for the TEM mode, that cutoff wave number was zero. Well, if KC is zero, this second term in our wave equation drops out. And we're really just left with what is Laplace's equation. And this is something we saw from electrostatics. So this tells us that we can analyze the TEM mode as an electrostatic problem. It is not an electrostatic problem but this is telling us we can analyze it as if it is.
Given that we can analyze this as an electrostatics problem, let's derive a governing equation slightly differently. Remember what happened to Maxwell's equations when we made the electrostatic approximation. We set our frequency term to zero, or if we had the time domain equations, we set the time derivative to zero. Regardless, we ended up with these four equations for the electric fields. We also saw that the magnetic fields formed another set of equations. They decoupled. But we ended up with those four equations for the electric fields, for electrostatics. So the first thing we'll do is we will take our constitutive relation and plug it into equation 3B. And that's going to eliminate this D field. So we will have del dot epsilon times E. And that equals zero. The next thing we will do is we will replace the electric field in this equation with our definition of the electric potential. So E is the negative gradient of the electric potential V. So we'll take this minus del V, plug it in for the electric field here, and now we end up with a single equation just in terms of a scalar quantity, the electric potential. And we love solving scalar equations instead of vector equations. Now, when we have isotropic materials, our permittivity tensor reduces to just a scalar constant. So this is how we would analyze inhomogeneous transmission lines and difficult to do on paper. So let's make the assumption that it's a homogeneous dielectric and we actually get Laplace's equation. So very, very simple equation to solve. That's probably the number one most solved differential equation in the whole world, particularly for numerical analysis, because it's such a simple, great example. So that's an alternate way to get to the same equation. We're solving Laplace's equation to analyze the TEM mode. Setup for TE and TM analysis. Before jumping into the math, let's remind ourselves about when TE and TM modes exist. What about a microstrip? Well, this is a transmission line. Transmission lines can support TE and TM modes. So the requirement really is just that it has a homogeneous dielectric. And we looked at this picture before. This microstrip does not have a homogeneous dielectric because you can imagine electric field lines fringing from the signal line up into the air and down into the dielectric. So the field lines are punching through two different dielectrics. It is inhomogeneous, does not support TE or TM modes. What about the strip line? Well, this has a homogeneous fill. It is a transmission line. Transmission lines are waveguides. They support TE and TM modes. It has a homogeneous fill. This does support TE and TM modes. It would be very rare that it, you would actually use it this way because then it would be a multi-moded transmission line and, and bad things can happen unless you're doing that on purpose. Then we move into the non-transmission line types of waveguides. This particular structure does not support TE or TM modes, and that's because there's an inhomogeneous fill. Let's look at two different cases of this rectangular waveguide. One has a perfectly homogeneous fill, and the other has a uniform direction. And this second case is not really one we'll talk about a whole lot here, but in either case, those support TE and TM modes. So when a waveguide does support TE and TM modes, it simplifies things considerably. Let's get into the math and set up our equations. Let's set up analysis for TE modes. TE modes is transverse electric. That means the Z component of the electric field is zero, but not the Z component of the magnetic field. So we had two equations, two differential equations, one defined the z component of E, the other defined the z component of H. But if our z component of E is zero, we just take the zero solution of that differential equation and we just ignore it. We're not solving this one. So we really only have one equation to solve for the z component of the magnetic fields. Given that solution, 
we can go back to our expressions for EX, EY, HX, and HY in terms of EZ and HZ and solve for the other four. So these equations are those expressions in terms of E not Z and H not Z, except I have set E not Z to zero. So once we find a solution to H not Z for TE modes, we can use these slightly simplified expressions to find the other four field components. We may be interested in the characteristic impedance for TE modes, and that is defined as the amplitude of the electric field divided by the amplitude of the magnetic field. We can substitute in the expressions we have above and simplify, and we end up here. And later on, when we actually solve this differential equation, calculate the phase constant, we will come back to this expression and calculate the characteristic impedance of the modes more precisely. But this phase constant needs to be found by solving our governing equation up here for the Z component of H. I'll mention one more thing. It's rather convenient we have everything in terms of the Z component of H because that is tangential to all of the boundaries and it makes applying boundary conditions a bit easier. We're going to repeat Almost the exact same thing for TM analysis. TM means transverse magnetic. Now we have the Z component of the magnetic field equal to zero. So we will ignore the differential equation for the Z component of H. Just take the zero solution for it. And we only have to solve for E naught Z, the Z component of E. So since H naught Z is zero, now our equations to calculate the X and Y components of E and H don't have to have H not Z in them. So here's our revised set of equations to calculate those remaining four field components. Like before, we can derive an expression for calculating the characteristic impedance of our TM modes. It's defined as the amplitude of the electric field divided by the amplitude of the magnetic field and at the end of the day, we end up with a very similar expression that we had for the impedance of the TE modes. We have the same problem, though. This phase constant can only be found by solving our differential equation. So once we find a solution and we get a more precise expression for beta, we will substitute it back into this equation and get a more precise equation for the characteristic impedance. The last topic in this lecture is setting up analysis for slab waveguides. So here's a picture of a slab waveguide and I've pulled the propagating mode outside of the slab just simply so that we can see it. So we are letting our mode propagate in the Z direction. The Y direction is perfectly uniform. Nothing is changing in the Y direction, not even the mode itself. It's not accumulating phase. There's no amplitude variation in the Y direction. Literally nothing is happening in the Y direction. Now in the X direction, this is where our, the amplitude of the mode would change, where we have changes in dielectric. So the X direction is a more complicated direction. So, this geometry lets us write the form of the solution. Just like before, the overall electric field is written as the product of two different terms. There's this amplitude term, and then there's this phase accumulation or oscillation term. So this beta, the phase constant, that describes how quickly this mode accumulates phase as it propagates in the Z direction. The amplitude term is now only a function of x. It does not change in the y direction, does not change in the z direction. The electric field does change in the z direction. That's described by this oscillation term. But the actual picture of the mode in the cross section does not. And here's some representative examples of what modes in a dielectric slab waveguide might look like. So these are different answers to the amplitude profile. And of course, each of these answers will also have its own phase constant, but that falls out of the analysis. We're not doing the analysis here. We're just setting up the governing equations to do the analysis. So slab waveguides, even though they are not 
homogeneous. They have a core and they have a cladding. They still support TE and TM modes. And let's talk about why that is. So we back up to our set of six coupled partial differential equations. These are the equations after we've substituted in our form of the solution. So we said in the last slide, this slab is perfectly uniform in the y direction. Literally nothing changes in that direction. The mode is not even propagating in that direction. So any derivative in the y direction has to be zero. That lets us go back to our six equations here and cross off any term that has a y derivative. Now when we do this, something magical sort of happens. Here's our equations without those y terms. Now what I'm going to do is color code the equations according to what I'm about to mention. Notice the terms in blue and the terms in red. The, the equations in blue do not contain any terms from the equations in red. And likewise, the equations in red do not contain any of the terms from the equations in blue. So Maxwell's equations have actually separated into two independent sets of three equations. The blue equations we will call the TE mode, and that's because there is no E naught Z anywhere in them. That means E naught Z is zero for the mode that we would calculate from the blue equations. Thus, we call it the TE mode. Similarly, the other three equations we would call the TM mode because there is no H not Z in them. H not Z would be zero, thus it's called the TM mode. So the TE and TM modes arise in slab waveguides because there's this uniform direction where nothing's changing that allowed us to cross off one of the derivative terms which caused some coupling, but that coupling's no longer there and Maxwell's equations have split into two independent modes. So let me just adjust these a little bit, make them look a little bit cleaner, and rearrange the equation numbers. So these are our equations describing TE and TM modes. We have a little bit more work to do to simplify these down to a single differential equation for each mode. Let's look at deriving this single differential equation to analyze TE modes. So we need the wave equation for our TE modes. So the first thing we'll do is we will solve equations 3B and 3C for H naught X and H naught Z respectively. So we basically have solved for the magnetic fields in terms of the electric fields. Now what we'll do is we'll take these expressions of the magnetic fields in terms of electric fields and substitute them back into this first equation. So I've rewritten the first equation. We replace H naught X and H naught Z with the expressions we just derived in equations 4A and 4B. And now I multiply out, take derivatives, simplify, and I end up with the final governing equation for TE modes. So that's the equation we would solve to calculate the TE modes of a slab waveguide. Now we'll do the same thing for the TM modes, but we start with our three red equations that describe the TM modes. Following what we did before, we will solve equations 3E and 3F, but now we're solving them for the electric fields in terms of the magnetic fields. And we will take these expressions for the electric fields and plug them back into the left side of our first equation. So we'll copy our first equation. Now we will replace E naught X and E naught Z with equations 5A and 5B. And I can simplify that equation. And I end up with the governing equation for calculating TM modes in slab waveguides. Here is some typical modes that we would calculate. So I've drawn the cross section of the slab waveguide. I've chosen the core in each of these cases to be 1.8 wavelengths wide. Why did I choose 1.8 wavelengths? Well, I just chose a big number because I wanted it to support multiple modes so that I could draw those modes. Otherwise, I just pulled the number out of thin air. Um, but 
Uh, you could solve these on your own, and here's some examples to replicate. And notice the TE and TM modes, they look very similar, uh, but the, the effective refractive indices, this is telling us essentially how much phase they're accumulating as they propagate, are slightly different. And for the TE modes, we are plotting the electric field, and for the TM modes, we're plotting a magnetic field. So if we were to plot electric fields for both, uh, they might actually even look a little bit different. Three quick points I want to make about slab wave guides before we end this lecture. Uh, the first one is it's a slab wave guide. The modes are confined only in one direction. So for our slab in the Y and Z directions, the mode is free to go in whatever direction that it wants to. We mathematically said let it only go in the Z direction but it's free to go in any direction. It's not confined in the YZ plane for us. Now, along these lines, if the mode, if we had chosen it to go in the Y direction, we would have calculated the exact same mode profiles, effective refractive indices. It does not change. No matter what direction the mode is going, uh, nothing changes. So we chose the Z direction simply for convenience. The other thing I'll mention just as a side topic of interest, direction could matter if the materials making our slab waveguide were anisotropic. Now that's also a much more complicated thing to analyze, we're not doing it here, but that assumption where no matter what direction the wave is going, everything changes, or I'm sorry, everything's the same, that would not be the case if the materials were anisotropic. So in summary, here's what we did during this lecture. We became better at looking at a waveguide and identifying what types of modes that it supports. Based on that, that leads us in a slightly different direction of how we'll analyze it because the simplifications we can make just were a little bit different for these four cases. And so each of those four cases, we went through the analysis setup. We saw that for TEM modes, that reduces to really an electrostatics problem, and we solve that using Laplace's equation. We had then TE and TM modes. We derived separate equations, so we had a governing equation for calculating TE modes. We had a governing equation for calculating TM modes. And when there are no approximations to make, we had this big ugly equation that we called calculating hybrid modes. And that's really where all six field components exist. This is complicated. This is hard. Uh, very, very hard to do on paper. And in the year 2020 that I'm recording this lecture, I'm not even sure it's worth it. I would do this numerically. And the last thing that happened is that we analyzed a slab wave guide. And for the TE modes, we're actually solving an electric field equation. And for the TM modes, we're solving a magnetic field equation. But we got TE and TM modes again in a slab waveguide.